So, um, for this talk, I want to consider music's potential as a critical art form following a series of recent propositions that variously call, uh, call for a move beyond contemporary art institutions. Uh, beginning with intersections between queer and feminist politics, radical listening practices, and political movements of the 1970s and the present, I examine the work of contemporary German artistic duo uh, Pauline Baudry and Renata Lorenz. Um, then as a reply to recent texts from Suhal Malik and Reza Negaristani, uh, I consider statements from 2013 that call for a, reg a resolute exit from the economic and symbolic circuits of the art world. Um, I then end with a, an intersection between these uh, two threads by asking if music can supersede such an art world exodus by mobilizing radical forms of collectivity. Um, so what uh, do I mean by critical music? Um, in my forthcoming book, which is titled After Sound Toward a Critical Music, I ar argue for a conception of music as a critically engaged art form in dialogue with contemporary art, continental philosophy, and global politics. Uh, I examine a diverse collection of art projects that intervene into specific political and philosophical conflicts by exploiting music's unique historical forms. Um, through a series of intimate studies of artists and collectives surveyed from the global visual and performing arts of the past 10 years, uh, Pussy Riot, Ultra Red, Vondel Weiser, Hong Kai Wong, Peter Oblinger, Cassie Thornton. I offer a way out of one of the most vexing deadlocks of contemporary cultural criticism, the choice between a sound art effectively divorced from the formal historical coordinates of musical practice and the hermetic neo-absolute music that dominates new music circles today. I insist on critical music as a category irreducible to sound as a medium, and the artists I listed above uh, use a range of different forms, performance, installation, social practice, conceptual art. Uh, beyond sound, these artists stage forms of participation and collectivity by reimagining re music's historical forms. They organize bodies through processes of listening and enunciation by composing radical forms of collectivity. Of course, sound does appear uh, in, in the practices of these artists, but its presence should not limit our consideration to what Max Neuhaus uh, has called the un unremarked commonality that unites both, both contexts of new music and sound art, namely sound. So uh, departing from these contexts, sound art and new music, critical music, what I'm calling critical music, maintains an important relationship with contemporary art since it is the primary uh, context for the majority of the artists I discuss. Yet, of course, one may nevertheless question the degree to which contemporary art can present a viable arena for such a critical music, or even a critical practice more generally. Considering the question, is a critical practice possible today, contemporary art remains problematic. So just consider uh, Peter Osborne, philosopher's um, recent characterization of contemporary art's structural liber libertarianism. So especially given this recent uh, explosion of expressions of dissatisfaction and dissent from contemporary art. So is it possible then to imagine an, an alternative context, not only outside of new music institutions, but also beyond the grasp of contemporary art? Um, if we can conce conceive a music after sound, can we also imagine a music after art? These questions follow a series of recent statements throughout 2013 uh, that call for a resolute break with contemporary art institutions. I want to proceed with a consideration of music uh, in relation to these imperatives to move beyond contemporary art. But before that, I want to consider the work of, uh, the recent work of, of Baudry and Lorenz. Um, they also, in 2013, I heard a film and video realization of uh, American composer Pauline Oliveros' 1970 <coughs> score to Valerie Solanus and Marilyn Monroe in recognition of their desperation. Uh, Baudry and Lorenz's 18-minute film follows six performers through Funkhaus de la Pestraza, uh, a former uh, GDR radio studio in Berlin as they execute uh, Oliveros' score. Wearing brightly colored spandex outfits, the performers 
who represent a range of different gender identities, move slowly throughout the space while playing long tones on various instruments, guitar, accordion, theremin, keyboard, uh, and voice, all before congregating in a large soundstage area where the majority of the performance takes place. <coughs> Emerging from the context of contemporary visual art, Baudry and Lorenz's realization of Oliveros invites questions concerning the relationship between music and contemporary art, while evoking broader issues around criticality, temporality, and collectivity. So uh, speaking at a roundtable discussion at MoMA in 2014, Lorenz refers to feminism in the 1970s and queer politics in the present, explaining that their project seeks to, quote, bring together these different political moments and to ask with Oliveira's score, what's the desperation now? B uh, Baudry and Lorenz's project implicates the musical score as a, as a means to reanimate the past, as a way to bring together different temporalities at the same time through performance. Uh, not unlike Ultra Red's Silent Listen, the group's performances of uh, Cages 433 that reframed the homophobia of the, 1970, uh, of the 1950s in light of the AIDS crisis of the 21st century, uh, Baudry and Lorenz place Oliveros' feminist work of, of 1970 in dialogue with queer, uh, queer politics of the present. As a way of layering multiple, uh, multiple temporalities, Baudry and Lorenz enact a kind of chronopolitics. So, uh, Oliveros composed the score um, that they performed in 1970 following her reading of Valerie Solanas' infamous Scum, uh, Scum Manifesto of 1967, um, The Society for Cutting Up Men, um, seeking to express the manifesto's deep structure while framing Monroe and Solanas through Oliveros' feminist practice of deep listening. Oliveros explains that, what, that she was interested in the egalitarian principles expressed in, in Solanus's manifesto. Um, in her controversial statement, Solanus, whose work received a, uh, an upsurge in attention after she non-fatally shot Andy Warhol in 1968, promoted the eradication of men through, quote, total female control of the world, end of quote, a state that would lead to the ultimate extinction of humanity. Yet despite such an extreme stance, Solanus's manifesto can be read as premised upon anarchist forms of collective organization. The Scum Manifesto was, as Brianne Faz contends, a, par a paradoxically utopian text. Referring to Solanus's difficulties with publishers and Mer Monroe's struggles with celebrity, Oliveros asserts that, quote, both women seem to be desperate and caught in the traps of inequality, end of quote. A state that Solanus uh, resisted through the writing and direct violent action, but also through a call for non-hierarchical cooperation. Oliveros cites the following passage from Scum Manifesto as a primary point of departure for her composition, which reads, a true community consists of individuals, not mere species, <coughs> members, not couples, <coughs> respect, uh, respecting each other's individuality and privacy, at the same time interacting with each other mentally and emotionally free spirits in relation to each other, and cooperating with each other to achieve common ends. Traditionalists say the basic, of unit, the basic unit of society is the family. Hippies say the tribe. No one says the individual. Oliveros, attempting to mirror the deep structure of Solanus's cooperative community, uh, describes in her text score a scenario in which performers must work to maintain a a non-hierarchical relationship to one another. Each performer selects five different pitches and performs a series of long tones to which various forms of modulation may be applied. If at any point the volume level of a particular performer begins to dominate, uh, the rest of the ensemble is instructed to increase their levels accordingly to maintain equality. The score also specifies changes in stage lighting, which Baudry and Lorenz accomplish via a series of large backlit panels that surround the performers on the Funkhaus Nelepastraza soundstage. So uh, Baudry and Lorenz bring this tightly knit historical constellation composed of Oliveira, Solanus, and Monroe, but also of feminism and queer struggles of the 1960s and 70s into the present. To the question, is criticality possible today? 
Baudry and Lorentz answer with a reference to the past. Quote, we pursue moments in the past that look quite queer to us, in their quotes. Uh, politics is not a matter of a utopia that requires investment in futur futurity, but rather lies in a special form of historical engagement. In addition to this contemporary reframing of queer and feminist politics, Baudry and, and Lorentz's project can be read, uh, can be seen to extend the tension between dissent and collectivity found in various calls made throughout 2013 to exit the art world. So, in 2013, contemporary art fantasized about its own death, or at least it sought an exit strategy. Although it was, it was an important year for <coughs> sound art and music, 2013 also saw a proliferation of statements that contemplated an end to the art world. The monumental sound art, sound as a medium of art, closed at ZKM at, in Karlsruhe. Uh, New York showcased its much criticized Summer of Sound and Light exhibitions that included Moma's soundings and the Guggenheim's James Turrell, and a series of unrelated talks, publications, and, and roundtable discussions unfolded that variously appealed to contemporary arts collapse. The topics of financialization and increased inequality were central to many of these events, including ICA London's roundtable discussion, The End of the Art World. Uh, critic and art historian David, David Josselet's book from the same year, After Art, posited art as a kind of universal currency in the wake of contemporary art's thoroughgoing monetization. These statements arrived not long after uh, uh, critic David Hickey's announcement that he would leave the art world in hopes that it would be, quote, the start of something that breaks the system, end of quote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that note. Along with uh, the publication of Pamela M. Lee's Forgetting the Art World, Finally, uh, Andrea Fraser's 2012 Whitney Biennial essay indicted contemporary art as, quote, painfully contradictory, even as fraudulent, end quote. Taken together, these statements variously exhibit, exhibited the desire for a radical withdrawal from extant art world structures. They shared the perception of a certain limit point, an impasse calling for a succession from contemporary art and its institutions. But perhaps the most interesting of these events were talks given by critic and theorist Suhal Malik and Iranian philosopher Reza Negaristani. In his talk, The Human Centipede, A View from the Art World, delivered at Eflux, Negaristani uh, described a sequence of, uh, quote, mouths and rectums through which the art world bootstraps itself, end of quote, as contemporary art's financialized horizon. Uh, Malik's four-part inquiry into the conditions and horizons of contemporary art on, on, on the necessity of art's exit from contemporary art, uh, which this is the, the book that will be published out of that, uh, although I think it's not out until 2016. Um, it argued that contemporary art has hitherto sought forms of escape through various means, including participatory art and de-skilling. Uh, but if one is to have a genuine impact on, um, quote, anything beyond or larger than itself, Malik contended, art must exit contemporary art. Negaristani similarly uh, concluded that art must proceed through a systematic extraction from the contemporary art world. Uh, Malik's talk took the form of a series of axioms that began by describing a logic uh, inherent to contemporary art not central to, a, to any particular artist or, or, or artwork. Neither, he claimed, is where the action is. Contemporary art is governed by an, an affirmation of indeterminacy. Malik explained, quote, art's contents and claims are now at best placeholders or alibis for a series of power operations to which it is now subordinated, end of quote. Contemporary art's logic insists upon upholding what Malik described as an anarcho-realist maxim, an enforced state of anarchy that allows sustained abuses of power that prevents a realization of the kinds of collective projects that would effectively reach beyond the art world. Uh, Malik's thesis was that we must abandon contemporary art's anarcho-realist maxim in favor of a wholly different form of social organization. So 
One wonders then what this art beyond contemporary art might look or sound like. Do these statements simply refer to an art beyond contemporary arts institutions? Uh, would such an art require a ban on reference to existing art operating in a sense uh, outside of history? Um, for an inclusion of art historical reference might blow its cover and risk recuperation into the existing field of contemporary art. Is it not true that any such post-contemporary art would remain by definition wholly inherent to contemporary art bound by patrilineal descent? Would not such an origin prevent contemporary art from accessing that which is larger than itself? Malik and Negristani's talks shared a resolute critique of contemporary art and their flat out rejections of its current formation in favor of, a, of, an alter, of, of alternative forms of social organization. Yet not unlike Solanus's controversial manifesto, both speakers privilege forms of community and collectivity. Negristani, for example, questions whether contemporary art can provide a constructive contribution to the, quote, illiber illiberalization of freedom and collective enhancement, end of quote. And uh, Malik uh, began his talk by describing the dream of Dan Graham, <laughs> quote, all artists are alike. They dream of doing something that's more social, more collaborative, and more real than art. It is interesting that, uh, as Malik acknowledges, Graham's statement also appears as the epigraph of Claire Bishop's social practice study, Artificial Hells. Um, Malik thus indicates a link uh, between his exit strategy and social practice art. The latter being a field that, as, as Bishop notes, is premised upon historical forms of participation and collaboration found in music. So um, as the art world self-destructs, I can say that, <laughs> and new music institutions continue to prove immutable to certain forms of change, the question remains uh, as to where critical music practices are to be situated. Moreover, what forms of agency can, mus uh, can musicians and artists assert if they are required to move between or perhaps beyond current disciplines. Andrea, uh, Andrea Fraser noted in 2012 a, a profound sense of disconnect and alienation from the art world, uh, indicating in her own, um, indicated her own turn away from art theory and towards the disciplines of sociology, psychoanalysis, and economics. Relatedly, art artists and musicians have increasingly looked to philosophy, cultural criticism, activism, and other non-artistic disciplines as alternatives to existing institutions. Yet while contemporary art purportedly, pur purportedly un undergoes its own imminent destruction, the concomitant dismantling of public institutions and educational resources presents further obstacles for artists seeking to mu move beyond uh, existing institutions. And academia is perhaps no more immune to the kind of abuses of power and financialization that permeate the art world uh, the homeless professor and lifelong student debt remain intrinsic parts of the system. Nevertheless, as uh, contemporary art purportedly enters a phase of self-induced deterior, deteriorate, that word, <laughs> what can a work like to Valerie Solanas tell us about radical forms of equality, collectivity, and, res and resistance? Music offers ways to frame and reframe time. As, a, as an alternative to Malik's spatial metaphor of exit, Baldry and Lorenz's project engages politics, a, a politics of temporality by recasting historical moments through a musical logic. For Oliveros, as with Baldry and Lorenz, quote, music is not an object, but a, but a process of engaging bodies, times, and space, end of quote. Their project posits a form of composition based on radical forms of commonality. As a process of engaging bodies, times, and spaces, these artists rearticulate a music beyond sound that stands both in dialogue and as a challenge to contemporary art and its institutions. Not simply an escape nor an exit, they compose collective forms through an iterative engagement with the past. In After Art, Jocelyn concludes that, quote, one need not exit the art world nor denigrate its capacities. Instead, we must recognize and exploit its potential power in newly creative and progressive ways, end of quote. Despite the persistence of the art world and new music institutions, 
one should not hesitate to leave behind sound as an autonomous medium. Our, our real work begins after sound and art by composing radical collective formations of bodies, times, and spaces.